It all starts with one idea. Have you ever wondered how today's top CEOs, business leaders, and people who work for the most innovative companies in the world found success? Join host George Davison as he explores the innovators that are shaping tomorrow's world today. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of The Innovators. And today, we have Rita Berenwall, and she is the Vice President and Chief Nuclear Officer of EPRI, which stands for Electric Power Research Initiative. Welcome, Rita. Thank you. Well, I'm hoping that you're going to share your, all your life stories with us today uh, so that our audience can pick up on how you became who you are in, this, uh, in, in your professional world. I'm looking forward to our conversation. Thank you. All right, so let's chat, first of all, about your organization, Electric Power Research Initiative. What do you do? So Electric Power Research Institute is a nonprofit research and development organization really serving the benefit of society, mm. and we focus on research and development for the energy sector. Uh, lo we look at renewables, we look at uh, fossil, we look at nuclear, mm. and I, as the vice president of nuclear, oversee all of the nuclear sector's activities. That sounds exciting. So it you is. get to see over everything. Um, so at your organization, can we talk a little bit about where are you headed in the future? How... So in your field, uh, with your title, um, what role does innovation play in, your, you know, in the future? Oh, it's very important. Mm. We need to continually innovate in the nuclear field so that we can continue to improve operations, reduce costs, and stay on top of our game, essentially. Yes. It, it is crucial that we continue to innovate, and we think it's so important that we actually have a, a, an organization that focuses really just on innovation, and yes. we are actually looking forward to having a global innovation forum early next year in London, nice. where we're inviting different, I would say, diverse folks to come and help us innovate uh, for the nuclear sector. All right. Well, well done. That sounds good. Uh, can you talk a little bit about your specific position and what you do? So I am responsible for the entire nuclear sector at EPRI, and EPRI works with its members. So we have members across the world mm -hmm. that pay a membership fee so that they can get access to our research and development data and results so that they can continue to operate efficiently or if they happen to encounter an issue, We've probably done some research in that area that can help them solve the problem that they might be encountering. Um, so that's, that's part of what we do. And then we also go out and work to look at advanced nuclear, right? And so we have a program called Advanced Nuclear Technology where we are working with advanced nuclear developers to help with eventual deployment of new nuclear technology all okay. around the world. All right. So tomorrow morning... I'm waking up as Rita, let's say. What does my day look like? Oh, boy. Uh, I will probably have a meeting to talk with my team. So I have a few directors that report to me. So we'll talk about, um, you know, what are we going to do for the week or what have we done? Have we encountered any uh, hiccups that we need to go address? Then I might have a meeting with one of my member uh, CNO, so another chief nuclear officer, mm. to talk about what EPRI has done for them and what can we be doing better for them to meet their needs. Uh, I might have a meeting with my boss, who's the senior vice president at EPRI and oversees not only nuclear, but also all the other generation sources. And uh, I might have an all-hands meeting with my team, so over 200 employees, and, and just talk about you know what's going on. We're in the middle um, of making sure that everyone can transition back to the office. And so, mm. um, you know, mm -hmm. what does that look like? Right, right. It is, it's been a little chaotic the last just, year and a half. Just a bit. Just a bit. <laughs> well, it sounds like you have an interesting position, something that's going to definitely keep you uh, active and uh, in a mental and physical capacity. Um, so can you run us back in time and talk with us a little bit about how you got an interest in the field of nuclear? Oh, that's actually an interesting story. 
Um, when I was in high school, I really didn't know what I wanted to pursue. In, I knew I wanted to go to college, but I didn't know what I wanted to pursue. So I applied to schools that had good engineering programs, because that's kind of the way that my parents were pushing me, but that also had good arts programs, because I thought I might want to pursue fashion design. Mm. Um, then my freshman year, I toured a material science and engineering department and fell in love with this instrument called a scanning electron microscope. And I said, I want to do whatever I can to work with that piece of equipment in my job. Hmm. So I went to get a, ma- uh, a bachelor's in material science of engineering, went on to get my master's and my PhD in material science and engineering, and did get to use that piece of equipment in my <laughs> job. Um, and my first job out of graduate school happened to be at a nuclear facility. I wasn't seeking it out, but it just sort of coincided. And it happened to be Bettis Atomic Power Laboratory in Pittsburgh. Yes. I was developing advanced nuclear fuel for the U.S. Navy's aircraft carriers and submarines, and I had the privilege of visiting Newport News Shipyard. That's an impressive site. It was very impressive, and I happened to be there when the Ronald Reagan was being constructed Mm -hmm. and was able to stand inside the compartment where the reactor was going to go, and I realized that this little itty-bitty thing that I'm working on back in the laboratory in Pittsburgh, this little bit of fuel, is going to help power this behemoth of a ship. And that's really what convinced me to stay in this business, that we work in an industry that is that's fueled by uranium that's so energy dense. Um, It was really impressive. Now, if we fast forward to today, I've got two snarky teenagers, and I want them to inherit a world that is cleaner than it is today. Mm -hmm. And nuclear power absolutely has always been a, a clean and green energy source and will continue to be so. So it needs to be part of the clean energy future that we've been talking about well, I'm glad to, I'm glad you're bringing that up because I have uh, I have well I have one snarky uh, daughter teenager still left in my house <laughs> and uh, and and you know she's kind of curious about that part of the world too you know sustainability recycling and uh, and you know power and generating energy is a uh, it's a it's a field that's full of fossil fuels and space fuels right and uh the picking the best way to go is a uh, is always a challenge at least we have a blend to choose from today right exactly exactly it's good to have a diverse mix yes i mean can you imagine i mean having uh like the ronald reagan as a as a aircraft carrier i mean you, you couldn't really run that thing on coal could you <laughs> not with that, not without you know getting detected often and having to come back into port and having right. ships follow you with that fuel. Right. right. So w- there's all sorts of different energy sources that play different roles through the challenges. So you look at your design problem and your logistics problems, and you try to come up with solutions, right? And that's right. that's kind of a, um, a fun way to look. It's a puzzle, and you've got to figure out the best way to go about it. So, um, and the same thing happens with uh, our lives, right? We are, we're young, we're, uh, we're a puzzle, and how do we navigate it? You have some young, uh, some young children as well. So we're going to try to reach back into that space a little more. And maybe we could shed some light on how you got interested, but further back. Like, was there something in high school that maybe, or maybe middle school, was there a person, was there a, what was it? Was there, can you go back and find a certain thing that ignited your imagination that, that worked for you? Because if it's, if it's not there for your, your two children, it's not, maybe not there for mine right now, but was there one for you or two or something back in middle school or high school that triggered you? I don't know that it was one event that triggered my curiosity. Mm-hmm. It was, I have, I have memories of trying to assemble furniture, Interesting. right? When we would get like a new shelf or something, trying to mm-hmm. assemble it without the instructions. Yes. Um, and, and usually it worked out, but sometimes it didn't. Right. But, but, you know, that kind of engineering hands-on activity was really, really uh, gratifying to me. Um, my father worked in uh, 
polymer research. Mm -hmm. And so I was also kind of had that exposure as well to that side of science and engineering. So that I think certainly helped. Um, But there was one teacher in eighth grade who had a huge impact on me. Mm. And it wasn't necessarily in the curiosity side of things, but it was more on how I behaved in, in group settings. And she held a parent teacher conference with, with my te- with my parents, um, which sounded like it might be bad news, right? Because it was kind of off cycle. And so we went in and we talked and, and she said, Rita's doing fine. There's no issue there, but she's really quiet. Mm-hmm. And I was shy and quiet. And, and the teacher said she needs to participate more and, and contribute to the conversation more. Mm-hmm. And so that was really a turning point for me wherein, you know, I would start raising my hand more, making my opinions known a, a yes. bit more, not overly so, but just, you know, knowing that it was kind of a gap. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that teacher really put me on a different course than I might have been um, on originally. And, and so I do credit her quite a bit. Way to go, teacher. You got her to move <laughs> into a different area. Well, and that, you know, communication and, and participating is critical in the field of innovation. So absolutely, I don't know what we, I don't think we as innovators here could operate without it. So <laughs> right, right. Well done. Uh, so let's see here. Um, did you have, now it sounds like your, your dad was um, somewhat instrumental in getting you into science because that's his field where he kind of came from, but uh were there any other mentors that you bumped into along the way other than the teacher and your father? There, oh, there were some. Um, there were some that actually articulated something negative to mm-hmm. me. Yes. And I took the position of, well, I'm going to prove you wrong. Yes. Right? Like, oh, um, well, you're a female, and I'm surprised you're doing this well at al- in algebra kind of thing. <laughs> right, right. Um, and so... Uh, I remember I went back and visited a high school teacher, and I went to MIT, and I had an MIT crew shirt on. I rode for MIT. Yes. And he said, oh, is that your boyfriend's shirt? And I said, no, it's mine. <laughs> so and offensive. so it was, it was that kind of, you know, p- even my teachers had this mentality mm-hmm. of, well, you should pursue this, and others should pursue this other route. Um, and so it was more of a, a feisty kind of mm-hmm. um, defiance perhaps but it worked right. nonetheless it worked for me it, it, it got you fired up right and you went right. to go chase it and no one was going to stop you well done we love that kind of determination and it, you know i think that there's a, a lot to be said about that it's uh it, the failure you know having a failing at something it's a great motivator right it's like i, I want to do that again I, I i know i can figure out a way or I'm not supposed to be able to do this. I'm, a, quote, a woman, right? And I, I'll tell you what, if I was a girl and somebody said, I would just, I'd want to go run right through that wall, right? Yep, yep, so yep. I'm glad you did. Uh, thank you for your contribution uh, to this to this um, this event today that we're doing. So um, let's continue. Uh, let's see here. We're going to talk a little bit about advice and a role toward the future. If you could do any one thing over in high school that really just didn't work for you, other than the one item we talked about before. Um, what I'm going to try to relay here is when we're in high school, we don't always do the best things. You know, we're, we're in high school. We, we're growing. We're making all sorts of decisions. Our minds are forming. Were there any, did you have any trip-ups along the way, or was it pretty a, you know, a kind of a straight course to MIT? Oh, I'm sure there were trip ups. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was far from perfect. Yes. Um, it was, um, it was, sure, I mean, it was high school. It was difficult. Yes. Um, and I, I certainly was, um, I would, well, you know how they have those superlatives, best smile, nicest hair, all of that? Sure. Um, I was, of course, given my drive, was, was at the point of driving for or, or pushing for, um, most you know most likely to be successful or most likely to whatever that superlative is mm-hmm. and i got voted most individualistic mm. so um which was fi- in in hindsight i'm proud of that yes but at the time i thought well wow everyone thinks i'm a loner yeah right right i would do if i was you right mm-hmm. um so it was you know i had not 
hung out with the popular kids or, you know, I would certainly wouldn't consider myself a jock. Mm -hmm. Um, But I I did my own thing um, and felt at the time that it wasn't the the right thing. So my my advice, my thought to, to folks who are kind of in that situation is it all works out. It all works out. Um, and one of the highlights of my career is that I was nominated by the President of the United States to be the Assistant Secretary for Nuclear Energy in the U.S. Department of Energy. And when that happened, the first thought that came to my mind is if my high school self could see me now. Wow, that's insightful. That really is. Thank you. Because I, that is so powerful to think back and look back like that. Because as a young person, we don't do that, do we? Well, you don't have that much to look back towards, right? right? It's almost it's right, scary to like look forward and look into the future and say, what is, how, how do I dress? How do I look? What did I accomplish? What am I doing? Am I married? Do I have kids? I mean, there's a million other things that are scaring us about that future. And it really, it shouldn't be scary. No. It, it You're going to navigate, right? But it sounds like you've navigated very well. Congratulations on that, by oh, the way. Well, thank you. But the course was not prepaved. I'll, I'll say mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. That's... So there you go. It's not prepaved, everybody. You're going to have to figure it out. And sometimes it's a rocky road. <laughs> so, well said. All right. So let's chat a little, if we could, about um, how important are STEM-based classes for someone interested in pursuing a career in this field? I think it's really important, mm-hmm. but I wouldn't say it's 100% required. But let me go back to it is really important. Um, we need folks that can think critically in science, technology, uh, engineering, math, that teaches you to be mm-hmm. a critical thinker. Um, and so, like I said, I'm a materials engineer, but I've been in the nuclear field my entire career. But we also need diversity of thought. And so to, it's great that we have STEM majors in our midst. hmm but we also need a smattering of, you know, English majors, art history majors, um, Latin American majors. It's we need that mix to bring in um, thought that prevents us from all thinking the same. Yes, understood. So you had you mentioned earlier in this discussion that you thought maybe you were going to go into the arts, right? Right. And uh, when you start to blend, let's say science, technology, engineering, and then you throw in arts, uh, you can really start to create a lot of uh, new ideas, integrating new thoughts that maybe haven't been seen before. So yeah, I like that idea of, um, of different types of thinking, different types of people, different viewpoints in order to try and frame uh, what you would consider at that point in time maybe the best way to go about something. Is mm-hmm. that a fair way to say it? Sure. The best way, we might even think it's the right way. Yes, because uh, now you're designing something that is, you know, representing all viewpoints and all thoughts. Um, I'm just kind of reflecting back on some of my, uh, on how we've created a lot of things in the past, and uh, I couldn't agree more. We have, because we, we do employ quite a few artistic people, and then we have technology, more or technology-oriented people, and there's such deep respect for both sides mm-hmm. of that, uh, that discussion. So, um, yeah, let's, all right, so let's keep going. So knowing what you know now, what advice would you give a person interested in entering your industry? Oh, please, come join us. <laughs> uh, we we uh, would be happy to have you, and even if you just even have an inkling of interest, um, there's a lot of opportunities out there for um, getting a little bit more information on the nuclear uh, energy field. Um, there are internships to be had all over the country, all over the world, mm-hmm. um, with companies, with national laboratories, with universities. And I think internships are the best way to try something. It's sort of an audition for you with that entity, but also for um, you to figure out, is this something you want to really pursue for the rest of your life? Or, right. you know, a three-month stint might be good enough for you to realize this is not what I want to do. And really, no harm, no foul. You've, you've tried it, and now you know for sure one way or the other if you like it or not. Um, so that's really what, 
would I would encourage. All right. And as a young person who's never done an internship, that word may be a little scary to them. Um, how would a how do you go about trying to get one of those an internship? So I would if if it's um, a high school student looking for an internship, you know, you need to start probably scouring the internet and and look at you know if it, if you want to stay local, which most I would say high school students probably do. Sure. Um, look at local universities. Um, look at local companies, and most of them have a. a tab that would be around careers or job opportunities and look at those. But then also, you know, be a little bit bold and feel free to send a note, send, if you have a resume, uh, send your resume to the human resource office and see what happens. Yes. Yeah. It's it, it, Go explore it. Make the call, send an email, write a note, put it in the, if you're going to go snail mail. But, uh, you know, you just muster up the energy, get over the fear, and go try. Right. Right? Right. And that, I think that's uh, the young folks. Um, because I think looking back and you wandering through your life and seeing that piece of equipment that that just captured your imagination and seemed to be like one of the things that really got you moving. Um, when you go to an internship, you're going to see interesting people, maybe some interesting machines, um, interesting things being made, which might just ignite your imagination or not. And then you can move on and say, no, that's not right for me. Um, in, my, in my world, I went into, uh, when I was in college, I had two fields that I explored and I didn't select either one of them. And, but it was critically important that I learned what I I thought this is what I wanted to do, but no, I, no I, I would be bored if I did that. Right? And so it's important that you get exposure. Um, did you have exposure to other fields other than the one that nuclear? Um, I had, expo- I would say, exposure to engineering as a whole Yes. Um, and, and a lot of different science um, kinds of things, uh, science, scientific activities, I would say. Um, I had internships uh, at, a, at aerospace companies, mm-hmm. at NASA, um, uh, and all, I mean, also through uh, graduate school, tried a few different things as well. Um, you, you asked about regrets. Yes. The one regret that I do have was in college, and mm-hmm. MIT had this glass blowing facility in the basement. And to this day, I regret not taking part in that activity because now I've tried glass blowing and yes. I loved I loved it and yes. I thought oh, I had that at my disposal <laughs> for 3 years and I didn't take advantage of it. Isn't it a release? You can go in and work and work and work and then go do a creative activity. Some people bake, some people blow glass, but the creative arts are such a great way to just release and uh and then you can get back to that other grinding work that you enjoy that challenges your brain, right? Um, I'm glad you found that, you know, because I've, I've, I, I enjoy doing creative arts myself, and that's at least what I've... We actually refer to that around here as we manage it, right? We manage um, the process of creativity, and sometimes the mind is open, which we emulate with the open hand and we work on the problems and we try to grind through solutions and as we're doing this the mind gets tighter and tighter and tighter and we can't get any more ideas so what do we do we break we go blow glass we go do cooking we go do something else until our mind relaxes and then when we get back together we can solve those hard problems again you know and that's really important it is so managing the process um okay well knowing what you know um, do you believe that at this day and age, anybody could be successful? I do. I do. I think um, the few things that I would encourage folks to listen to is there's going to be other folks in your life that will see something in you that you may not see in yourself. You might get that tap on the shoulder or that phone call or that in today t- text mm-hmm. um, saying, hey, I, I think you should try this or I think you should apply for this job or this internship might be good for you. And you yourself might think, mm, I'm not qualified or I don't think I want to try that. 
I would say try it mm. because that individual sees something in you that you may not see in yourself, and those opportunities don't come that frequently. I've had two such opportunities, and they've both really worked out for me. But both times, I doubted myself, I doubted my abilities, but trusted that those individuals who said, you need to apply for this job, or you need to try being a manager. Yes. Well, uh, you know, Rita, it sounds you've been very successful in your career. And I'm curious um, if you had advice out there for some young folks that, let's say they're not all that you know, that uh, studious, you know, why did you, you know, decide to be studious? Why, why did you do that? Do you recall? Like, how did it just, you start doing the math and why did it become important? Was it something because your parents said you had to do it or did you find that you solved one up a problem and then you said, I want to do more of that? Um, can you can you locate that space in your mind as to how that worked? Some of it was certainly yeah, my parents saying you know this is important. Yes. Um, but also the the satisfaction that came with figuring out uh, you know a, a complex math problem or understanding chemical equations and mm-hmm. how they worked um, or physics for that matter. Um, it was, it, it, it like sparked something in me where, oh, I get it. I yes. get it. And let me try this other one. Or if I don't get it and I'm, I'm failing, let me, let me figure it out. Let me figure it out mm-hmm. and see how to get the right answer. Or maybe there's not a right answer. Um, and you go forth and you provide a, 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 your thought or your solution. Um, and the teacher or the professor thinks, oh, that's, that's, interesting Mm -hmm. right a little bit of uh positive feedback i guess is is, is, can go a long way as well it sure can oh my goodness um i'd say that my teachers as well the ones that inspired me the most were the they were engaging and uh, i love my chemistry teacher and a few others that uh positively encouraged me to do certain things and it made big impacts um and maybe that's another way of looking at it too is when people when others believe in you you know they you don't I didn't want to let them down and and I didn't want to let myself down but I don't know I just fell in love with chemistry after that moment mm-hmm. um maybe the because this is hard for me to tackle the, the what I'd like to chat about next but what about the kids out there that don't have parents that are encouraging you know the parents who say no, you won't be successful, or maybe I don't have a parent. Um, would you have any suggestions to young folks that might be listening to this podcast, but they really don't have any positive forces in their life around them? I would suggest um, reaching out to your teachers mm-hmm. and saying, you know, I like chemistry, but I don't know what else I should be doing. Or or is there something I could do after school? Or can I have, you know, can you develop or point me to a project that I could perhaps do? Teachers are a really good resource. Yes. Um, And if you're you're in college or, you know, having an internship or in a job, I would say reach out to a a leader in your respective organization. And the example I always give folks is there was a point where I was um, working at Bettis, and we were about to have this joint project with NASA. And I just assumed that my boss would know that I wanted to be on that NASA project. Yes. And something in me said, let me just go tell him that I want to be considered for this project. So I mm-hmm. did. I went and told him, make sure, you know, not make sure, but, uh, you know, I, right. I, I want to put my name in the hat to be on this project. Mm-hmm. And he said, oh, I'm glad you came and talked to me because I never would have thought that you'd be interested. And so it's really about raising your hand, saying that you want to pursue something, and then using those leadership, uh, the resources that you have in your leadership. If it's a teacher or a principal or a guidance counselor, guidance counselors are really good resources. Yes, they they're, are. They're a, a, a bevy of information, but they may not know what your interests are. So go and I would suggest making an appointment with your guidance counselor and saying, I'm interested in you know chemistry or um I think I might like physics, but I don't know what else I should be doing. Right. They can help. 
They really can. Um, thanks for that perspective because um, I think it will help some of the uh, the kids out there that don't have as much guidance at home and whatnot um, because, you know, you can – be success. You can be successful, and you can find your path in life. And um, those teachers are there to try and help you to achieve that objective. Uh, so reach out and uh, and keep trying, and you'll get there. So, what do you think the next big innovation is going to be in nuclear? Can you share any of those thoughts with us? I think using advanced manufacturing techniques. Mm-hmm. So let's within that umbrella is additive manufacturing or 3D, 3D printing, printing. Mm-hmm. Um, to develop new components and perhaps new fuel mm-hmm. for the nuclear industry will be revolutionary. You can design a component to fit whatever shape you need and perform whatever function you need Mm -hmm. versus being at the moment confined by what's called subtractive uh, manufacturing and uh, confined to specific materials and specific pieces of equipment. So I think really leveraging advanced manufacturing techniques is going to be the next big thing. And what we need in our industry to overcome is this mentality of not invented here, right? Well, we didn't invent it, so we aren't going to be using it. No, let's let's bring in the other brainiacs and and mm-hmm. let let's use what they've already invented. Yes. All right. So, a lot of the schools out there have these three D printers. That would be a good idea to start playing around with that if you aren't already. Um, they usually have some laser cutters and things of that nature as well. Uh, and then explore the world of different materials that you can put through these types of machines and let's see what that creative mind can come up with. Absolutely. We're going to need all of you out there in the future here soon. So let's get busy. All right. So let's, uh, let's go one step direct in a totally different direction. And we're going to imagine that we have uh, some education leaders, let's say that shape the courses and the things that the students are going to be taking Um, based on your background and history, if we could talk to those people, what kind of recommendations would you would you make to them that uh, might be beneficial that, from your perspective? I would say to that, to that community, uh, make sure that uh, you leverage all of the resources that are out there. There's so much online content now, mm-hmm. um, even specific to nuclear energy. Um, for example, the American Nuclear Society has a program called Navigating Nuclear that's for K through 12 curricula. Um, and so it's, the content is out hmm. there. It's a matter of, yes, you have to, even educators have to do the homework and, and find what's appropriate to fit yes. into their um, lesson plans. But, but to look for new information, new content, uh, kind of refreshing lesson plans if, if need be, if that's the appropriate way to frame that. Um, and then there's a lot of, for, for those that um, might be in the, in the post, I would say post-secondary aspect of things, um, online courses as well that, that students can be encouraged to take that may not be at their university or even you know, the associate's uh, co- community college or associate's degree kind of programs. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's, to me, just absolutely remarkable how much information is out there that we can all, even me and you, yes. participate in and in, in learn new things about. Well, hopefully they're listening. <laughs> and Rita, thank you so much for your time today and, and helping our audience to see uh, a little into your world. And uh, so thank you for coming. Thanks for having me. For more information about the innovations and ideas changing tomorrow's world, Tune into Tomorrow's World Today, now streaming on science and discovery, or visit tomorrowsworldtoday.com. For more information about the innovations and ideas changing tomorrow's world, Tune into Tomorrow's World Today, now streaming on science and discovery, or visit tomorrowsworldtoday.com.